Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview, where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-host, Frédéric Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Teddy Woodward and Jeff Wu, who are respectively co-founders, as CEO and CTO of Notional Finance. Before we talk to Teddy and Jeff, uh, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. With Paraswap, you can beat the market price every single block. It's fast, highly liquid, and they just launched the Reef 5, which has brand new contracts and APIs. It has a modular infrastructure, which is more gas friendly and now supports free approvals using Ethereum's permit messages. They also recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, and BSC. And you can always use Paraswap with your, with your Ledger device right in Ledger Live. So go to paraswap.io to get started. Proof of Stake is transforming crypto and you can be a part of it. Start participating in networks, contribute to network security, and earn rewards by staking with Course One. Course One is your staking provider securing billions in assets for over 10 million, 10,000 customers on 25 networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. If you're interested in running your own branded nodes, well, they have a managed white label node as a service offering that leverages Course One's highly available and proven infrastructure. Course One also just helped launch Lido for Solana, which is really exciting. Uh, Solana's liquid staking solution that allows you to stake and participate in DeFi at the same time. So head over to chorus.one and start your staking journey. So hi, Ted and Teddy and Jeff. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Sebastian. Yeah, thanks for having us. So before we get started uh, and dive into Notional Finance, uh, tell us a bit about your backgrounds and how you became interested in crypto. Uh, okay, I'll start. So um, I uh, started my career, I was, I was actually working in banking. So I was an interest rate swap trader. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, you know, I, I started there for, for about four years at Barclays. And um, I really liked trading, but uh, I kind of hated working for a bank. And uh, it seemed to me that it was very much uh, the way of the past. And so I was sort of trying to figure out, you know, what, you know, what the new thing in finance was going to be. And cryptocurrencies just seemed like an obvious sort of next step. Um, whereas, you know, because I was working in, in sort of finance post financial crisis and there were all these regulations that were making it very uh, almost impossible to do anything new or interesting or creative, um, which, you know, there's a reason why those regulations were in, were in place. Um, but it was a lot more boring to work uh, in that environment. And, um, you know, so I saw cryptocurrencies, which is a completely new thing. And just like, um, and it just seemed to me to just be like super exciting and intellectually interesting. And so I wanted to be a part of it. And um, I left uh, my job to trade crypto um, for a family office in 2018. Uh, and then sort of towards the end, Towards the end of that, so end of 2019, um, I wanted to get into DeFi, and uh, uh, I started Notional with Jeff um, in January of 2020. So that's that's me. So Jeff, what about you, and how did you guys meet? Yeah, so uh, so my background is more in tech. So I, you know, started my career in the Bay Area, working for a tech company doing data science and working with distributed systems. So in around like 2011, I, uh, you know, that's when I started my career. And back then kind of the hot new distributed system was Hadoop, which maybe some people remember, but that was sort of like the beginning of uh, like big data, like the big data kind of movement, right? And so, um, yeah, so I spent a lot of time doing data science, data engineering, um, and, you know, that type of work. Um, in 2016 and 2017, one of my coworkers introduced me to, to Bitcoin and uh, I just kind of naturally like became fascinated with the technology. And really at that same time, it felt like it kind of felt like the early days of, of like big data again. You know, this is like a cool new distributed system. It works at a much larger scale. And so it kind of got me excited again about some, something new. Um, it didn't really like click for me as to like why someone would want to use blockchain or crypto until I started reading about MakerDAO. And that's when I was like, OK, this is like there's a natural kind of product market fit here with uh, with financial products. Right. Like this, this really makes sense to me. And so 
in 2018. I uh, I left my job and I took a took a new job at uh, Splunk as the product manager for their blockchain uh, for their blockchain team. So Splunk is uh, it's sort of a data analytics firm here in San Francisco, and um, you know I worked looking sort of at the blockchain crypto industry in general, uh, looking for like business opportunities for, for Splunk. And so in the course of that, um, in late 2019, I met Teddy actually at a, a Cosmos hackathon uh, here in San Francisco, where actually we met, we met Sonny. Uh, so it was kind of- I was a at the hackathon too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we I met- just, I, was, I was just walking around taking pictures and like, you know, like putting stuff on Twitter. I wasn't actually doing anything, but I was there. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah. That w- yeah. It was actually a surreal experience because I had been listening to Epicenter a lot and, uh, and I was having trouble with that. Cosmos SDK and like Sunny sat down next to me and started helping me. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like uh, kind of surreal. But yeah, Teddy, I met there just actually very serendipitously. Um, and uh, we 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 just I like I had wanted to do I we had both seen Compound come out like that very recently then. And we were I think we both just wanted to do a fixed rate, uh, fixed term version of that because we felt like that was like I was like, uh, like variable rates are cool, but like a fixed rate product is something that is more compelling to like a, a mainstream uh, audience. And so, and I also think like from when we first met at that hackathon, like within the first 10, 15 minutes, we, we just hit it off. Like we have a really good rapport in terms of like the kind of skills and expertise we bring uh, and that I think they complement each other really well. And and I think we also get along really well on a, on like a personal level. So um, Were you guys building anything at that hackathon? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we built a very early version of Notional. Um, it's a okay. fixed rate, uh, fixed rate kind of thing um, using the Cosmos Edge SDK. Actually, we we took first prize there, and that that kind of encouraged us to to keep going. So. Okay, cool. And so then you switched over because you were building it originally. I mean, the prototype or like proof of concept was on Ethereum uh, on on Cosmos. Uh, and then, you know, what made you decide to uh, pursue it on on Ethereum? I mean, I think in uh, so that was uh, late 2019. You know, at the time, you know, DeFi was still quite young then, and and all the activity was on um, was on Ethereum. So this seemed like a natural fit for us. Okay, cool. Actually, I think this T-shirt I'm wearing now, and I got from the conference, and I like my my daily water bottle is like the the water bottle from that hackathon. <laughs> I have like lots of swag from that conference for some reason. Um, I was going to wear the t-shirt, cool. but I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I, I had a question for, for, for you, Jeff, about your sort of past experiences and something that I often find myself thinking about because I, I'm not at all sort of like familiar with, you know, the, 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 the big data industry or like uh, that sort of like uh, ecosystem. And I wonder if there's anything that, you know, you, you, what are the things that you took away from that experience, like working in that industry that apply to crypto? Because like, I think in many ways are similar, but like in many ways are also different, like the types of infrastructure on which, you know, blockchains operate are like it's totally different from the types of things you were mentioning earlier. So like, what's the parallels there and how does that apply in the crypto space for you? Um, I think, I think one is just like, uh, they're both distributed systems, like uh, big data computing is, uh, it's distributed across, you know, I mean, a uh, kind of a cloud environment, um, but sort of the general principles of like state um, across multiple machines, uh, message passing, uh, you know, consensus, they're applied in similar ways. Um, so th- there's like a lot of like kind of low level kind of technological uh, kind of analogies between the two. Um, so that's one. I-, I do think from an engineering perspective, working in blockchain is is both fun and frustrating. I mean, if you're in the big data space, you sort of always have like at your fingertips, unlimited compute and unlimited storage, uh, sort of endlessly. Uh, and, but on the blockchain, right? Like that's not the case, right? Every byte you use like costs money, and there is like a lot of congestion. And so, uh, kind of flipping from like one like you know endless supply to like very limited supply is like a, it's an interesting engineering challenge. I think it's quite fun. Um, I would say that's kind of the big difference. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So let's talk about Notional. So you're uh, you already um, alluded to it. So Notional is a fixed um, rate lending and borrowing protocol. Um, 
maybe let's talk about this at a high level first. So why why is um, the fixed rate something that's desirable for customers? Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, the fixed, fixed rates are really desirable because they give people stability and certainty and the ability to plan for the future. Um, you know, and, and you can sort of, if you look at traditional financial markets, uh, you see that uh, the amount of fixed rate debt um, compared to variable rate debt is just like overwhelming. I think like something like 90% of the U.S. fixed of the U.S. That market is fixed rate as opposed to variable rate, which shows that, you know, empirically, it shows the importance that both borrowers and lenders place on sort of stability and certainty. And, and you know, just like, if, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's very challenging to do anything beyond, uh, you know, a, a very short term uh, time horizon if you're working exclusively with variable rates. Like if you want to take out a loan, um, you know, even just to use a, uh, an example from sort of your everyday life, you know, if you want to take out a loan to buy a car and the rate that you're, the rate of interest that you're paying on your loan fluctuates between 2% one month and 10% the next month, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult for you to plan and, um, you know, know if you can afford that, right? So, so, you know, if you extrapolate that forward to like, You know, if, if your rate of interest is fluctuating that much every sort of every day or every month or it has the potential to, I mean, it's very, very difficult to like commit to I'm going to borrow something for five years, you know, take out a loan that's like with five year maturity um, just because like you have no idea. I mean, it, it, it just makes it very, very difficult to do anything but something that's, you know, extremely short term. Uh, and, and so I think that like, you know, fixed rates beyond just sort of bringing in sort of a, a more you know, a user base that values certainty and stability can, can also just really expand like uh, the capability of sort of the DeFi system to enable use cases that are sort of more long-term and just like an, enable like new kinds of behavior. Um, yeah, so, so I think that's what we're really excited about. So... Teddy, um, can I ask something about legacy financial systems? So basically, I totally see that for consumers, um, having fixed rate loans um, is highly desirable just because you, loans that people typically have to um, to satisfy often are a significant portion of the money they have to spend, right? Um, but what you're, what you're doing in essence is that you're, buying insurance or you're buying some sort of financial product that um, that gives you a fixed borrowing rate um, whereas if you actually got the the borrowing rate that was just the borrowing rate of the day um, you would probably on average pay slightly less right so basically if, if you say 90 percent of our loans are fixed rate um, is that consumers or is that also um, is that also uh, companies because basically if I'm a big company and I kind of operate on that level um, I can take larger financial risks um, and kind of shave off like a couple of uh, tenths of a percent somewhere right yeah so I, I think that's actually not necessarily the case so y your assumption here is that um, essentially by by fixing your borrowing rate you're paying away some some expected value right, in return for getting this certainty. That's, yeah, that's, exactly. That, that's exactly what my assumption would be. Is that wrong? Well, I mean, it, it, uh, uh, it's not necessarily, it, it sort of depends, I guess, in, like, if we're going to get like super trading-y about this, like it, it sort of like depends in aggregate who values the certainty more, borrowers or lenders, right? It's, it's possible that, you know, for example, the lenders may perf like value the certainty more than the borrowers, and then theoretically anyway, they would be sort of willing to pay away some expected value in return for the certainty. And so it's not necessarily, um, but I think that, you know, in reality, it's just, it, it doesn't quite work like that. You know, so like, uh, for, you know, for example, the ability to borrow at a fixed rate is not just a, it's not just a, uh, like, A, a bet on where the sort of variable rate is going to be over the terminal loan. Because like, for example, you know, if you borrow, if you know what your fixed rate 
uh, on your borrowing is, it gives you the freedom to pursue perhaps uh, a certain type of investment that you feel like only might generate this amount of return. And the fact that you're able to fix your financing costs uh, gives you sort of the confidence and like the sort of minimal aggregate risk such that you will pursue that course of action, right? So it's, it's less of a like, you know, there's, there's a given amount that I'm going to borrow anyway. And like, should I borrow variable or fixed? It's, it's also sort of like, you know, I want to borrow fixed because that will allow me to take on, you know, this other investment opportunity, which maybe has a capped upside return. Um, and, and I'll know that because my borrowing rate is fixed, my profit's going to be positive, right? Or like I'll have a reasonable expectation. So I think it's, it's honestly just like more complicated than, you know, just uh, you're speculating on what the variable rate is going to be over the duration of a loan. It's, it's just more complex. So walk us through the product. I'd like to start with, you know, what the product looks like from the user perspective, and then maybe we can dive into, um, you know, the more technical aspects. But first, actually, I'd, I'd like to ask you, how much liquidity is on Notion? Uh, yeah, so so right now we're, we've had, um, you know, kind of fluctuating liquidity. I think like uh, right now we're in, in the order of 10 million TVL. Um, so, uh, kind of, you know, what we've been doing as, as a company, so I'll give you a little bit of background. So we, we launched Notional V1 in January of this year, and, uh, uh, we've had, you know, I think, uh, between 10 and $20 million of TVL, um, since the launch. And, and what we're doing right now is we're, you know, we've kind of got our heads down building Notional V2 and we're, we're just getting set to launch that. Uh, so Notional V2 is going live uh, in, in three to four weeks, um, fingers crossed. Uh, but that's going to be, uh, uh, you know, I think that that'll be a big step up for the protocol because we're sort of uh, making some significant changes to the protocol as well as launching our token and our public liquidity mining program. And we anticipate that, um, you know, this set of changes is going to uh, really be a big step forward for, for Notional. Cool. So then walk us through the product. Like what, what can I do as, as a user of, the, of, of this product? You know, if I'm a lender or a borrower and what does it look like for me? And maybe, you know, contrasting that to what people may all already be used to, which is, you know, Aave or Compound or some of these other lending platforms. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, so basically like the core concept in Notional is, is what we call Fcash. Um, and that is kind of like a zero coupon bond in that it is defined by a currency type and a maturity date. So for example, December 1st, 2021, uh, USDC is, is an Fcash token um, that matures on December 1st, 2021. Okay, so this Fcash token is transferable, it's tradable, and on December 1st, 2021, it can be redeemed for one USDC on Notional. So effectively, uh, December 1st, 2021 USDC represents USDC at that specific future date, okay? Uh, and the way we enable fixed rate borrowing and lending is by allowing users to trade between USDC today and USDC in the future as sort of represented by this Fcash. So if you're a lender, uh, you can sell your USDC today and purchase USDC on December 1st, 2021. And the exchange rate at which you make that trade between USDC today and USDC on December 1st implies a fixed interest rate over that period of time. So that's like the basic way that this works. And, and the way we sort of facilitate that trading is we have liquidity pools uh, on chain where we have you know USDC on one side, and US or December 1st, 2021 USDC on the other side. And you can sort of trade between them. And, and we have liquidity pools for different currencies and different maturities. So, you know, we'd have USDC December 1st liquidity pool, uh, you know, a USDC March 1st, 2022 liquidity pool, for example. Um, and so we have, as a user, you have multiple options. You can, uh, you know, borrow and lend, Dai and USDC at, at several different maturities. Um, so in a way, you're not actually, so the protocol doesn't fix 
um, an interest rate, but market mechanisms do kind of um, like they would in traditional financial systems. Th that's correct. So, and, and the way I think about it, and and you know, for everybody listening, um, I'm a trader, so so it's probably not the way that everybody else thinks about it. But I, I think about it less as borrowing and lending than it buying and selling cash in the future. That's that's the way that I think about it. And and yes, it is market determined, right? So we have these liquidity pools. As people borrow and lend, they move the prevailing. And do you, do you guys um, have basically liquidity providers or market makers that kind of um, uh, emulate what a currency market um, would look like on a legacy system? I, I suppose I, it's it's uh, it's it's in, it's interesting to to compare this to the sort of traditional financial system. But but yes, we, we, we do have uh, liquidity providers. So, so uh, the system relies on liquidity providers to put their capital into these liquidity pools so that borrowers and lenders can actually use the protocol. Yeah. And the liquidity providers, um, what, what's in it for them? So um, uh, basically, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Notional V2 here because we've sort of changed the way... Uh, We've changed the way that this works a little bit, but uh, basically uh, the liquidity provider earns interest on the capital that they put into the system. So in Notional V2, liquidity providers actually provide C tokens uh, instead of uh, the underlying token like DAI. They'll put in C DAI. So they earn uh, interest on their capital plus uh, trading fees. So anytime someone borrows or lends, They pay a transaction fee that goes to the liquidity providers, um, you know, very similar to Uniswap. Uh, so, so the liquidity provider is going to earn interest on their capital via compound. They'll earn transaction fees uh, from uh, borrowers and lenders on Notional. Uh, and they'll also earn uh, sort of, you know, in Notional V2 anyway, Uh, liquidity incentives in the form of our governance. Okay, maybe token. let's talk about the governance token in a bit. Um, but does that mean that the borrowers and lenders effectively um, get the same rates? So basically, uh, be, be, because there's no spread. Uh, so there, there is a spread, and the, the spread. Okay, is yeah, the but that's a one-time thing, right? Um, so it's not. That's correct. Yeah. So it's it's a it's like a true market rate, and borrowers and lenders get the same market rate, as opposed to something like a compound. Uh, where there's structurally a spread between the lending rate and the borrowing rate, that is not the case in Notional. There's there's like one interest rate that both borrowers and lenders uh, get. So what are the, I mean, the, the, there must be trade-offs to using Notional as opposed to another, uh, you know, lending platform. Uh, what would you consider those trade-offs to be? Um, okay, so, so I guess, uh, so... You know, I would compare it to something like uh, to something like Compound or Aave, uh, and the trade-offs. I mean, I think from my perspective, I think that the most significant trade-off is going to be just the fact that Compound and Aave have been around for a while, and they are lower risk. Therefore, right? Um, I think that smart contract risk is just an undeniable uh, thing that anybody has to reckon with in DeFi, uh, and if you're launching a you know a big ambitious new platform you know, like Notional V2, uh, you know, people need to think about smart contract risk, right? And and uh, a thing that, you know, Compound and Aave have is that they've been around for a while. And, you know, this most recent thing with Compound notwithstanding, um, they uh, uh, have, have, you know, built a very strong track record of, of security. So I, I would say that that's like, you know, that's probably the... Uh, most significant trade-off that I would that I would see. Yeah. I just want to add add a couple of things here. So one is that I think a, one mix, misconception that we we've seen a lot with Notional is that um, even if you're like lending or borrowing fixed on Notional to, you know, three or six months, you're not uh, locked into that for the duration of the term, right? So one thing about Notional is that you can, you know, lend And lend some money, and if you need to withdraw that money, you can sell that F cash back into the markets and get your money out, and you'll be able to sell it at sort of the current market rate at that point in time. So that's you know one thing that we've heard with Compound. Oh, you know, like Compound, I can always get my money out. Well, that's kind of uh, similar with Notional as well. 
Um, and I also say one trade off um, on the downside here with Notional is that since you are going through a liquidity curve, um, both on lending and borrowing, you know, the lending, the gas fee on the lending side is going to be um, similar to the borrowing side, right? So um, on both sides, the gas fees will be a little bit higher. I think on Compound, since you're just wrapping C tokens, it's it's cheaper on the lending side. Um, but, you know, for us, that the action is, is about similar on both sides. So you'll pay a little bit higher gas fee. Um, but uh, I think those are those are the main differences. Yeah. And what happens at the maturity date? Like, are you expected to have paid off your loan by the maturity date? And if you haven't, what, what happens? Do you get liquidated or what happens then? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, basically, uh, so and, and just for for your listeners' clarity here, so I, I'm I'm going to be talking about Notional V2. Okay. So so given that that we're launching this pretty quick or pretty soon rather, um, and we've changed a few things. So in in Notional V2, if you're a lender and and you reach maturity and you haven't rolled your loan forward, um, what's going to happen is that immediately upon maturity, you're going to switch from earning a fixed rate. Uh, to earning the variable rate. Okay, so so immediately upon maturity, you're no longer earning, say, 6% fixed. Now you're just earning the uh, variable compound lending rate on your cash. Okay, so you, there's no action necessary. That's what happens as a lender. Now, as a borrower, uh, it's so basically the, the way Notion works, it's, it's very important uh, in order for us to ensure that lenders can pull their money out when they're... Uh, entitled to taking their money out, we have to make sure that borrowers uh, essentially make good on their obligations right? and, and pay their debts by the time that they say they're going to pay their debts. Um, so if you're a borrower uh, and you borrow until March 1st, 2021 or 2022 rather, and you, you can roll your debt forward if you don't want to actually repay your debt. So, so, you know, let's say it's April 1st, you can decide, okay, so I'd really rather keep my debt open. So I'm going to roll my, my March 1st debt into, um, you know, March 1st, 2022 or 2023 rather. Um, so you can roll your debt forward. Now, if maturity uh, does come and you haven't paid your debt, what's going to happen is that a, a third party can roll your debt forward three months on your behalf. So essentially, uh, you will be forcibly auto rolled forward by three months at a penalty interest rate that's like uh, at the moment we've decided upon uh, a 250 basis point. So that's two and a half percent penalty to the current market interest rate. So, you know, if the three month interest rate was six percent, your debt would be rolled forward at eight and a half percent. Um, so there's like a little bit of a penalty that you're paying for not paying on time, but you are not going to get liquidated. Your collateral is not going to be seized. Um, your okay. debt that's, is just going to be rolled pretty, forward. That's interesting. That's it's quite s- different from the experience, say, like on a you know typical le- uh, lending protocol where like you borrow the money and you just like pay the interest for as long as you're there, and you know if you pay it back, whatever, like you're you're paying the interest on the on the principal. So when when this happens. Who are these third parties that get to kind of carry over your loan for the next three months? And are they, is there some kind of incentive mechanism here for them to do this or? Uh, yep, that's correct. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like a, a liquidation function and like, you know, we would expect the same kind of people who are going to be doing liquidations are going to be doing this sort of rolling forward. And, and the incentive is, is, you know, so we said that there's, you're, you're borrowing at this penalty interest rate, you're, you know, uh, Two and a half percent over sort of the market interest rate. Um, that 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 settlement penalty uh, is the liquidator's incentive. So they essentially lend to you at a two and a half percent premium to the market rate, uh, and then the expectation is that they would lend to you and then immediately sell that F cash that they got from you on the on chain market and just capture that spread. Okay, I see. Um, and you already um. You already talked about the fact that everything is collateralized. So can you talk about um, the choice of collateral and um, what the collateralization ratio is? Sure. So, so this is going to be something that, it, that, will, uh, that will change um, and on, on an ongoing basis. Um, but we are going to launch with, uh, so we're launching with the same four currencies that we have uh, live on Notional V1. 
So ETH, RET, Bitcoin, USDC, and DAI. Uh, and all four of those currencies are going to be lendable and borrowable. And they're all going to be eligible as collateral to collateralize a loan in any one of those currencies. Um, and the initial collateralization ratio uh, for like a, a USDC debt collateralized by Ether, for example, um, we're going to start off conservative. So we're starting off with a collateralization ratio that is that's roughly 150 percent. Um, so it's a you know a slightly more conservative collateralization ratio, but that sort of reflects the fact that you know this is uh, we're launching a brand new protocol uh, and we want to get comfortable before we sort of start making that ratio a little bit more aggressive. Uh, and then for ac the actual collateral types, um, so you know we're launching with those four, but uh, the Collateralization framework on Notional, very, uh, on Notional V2 is very flexible. So we, we will have the ability to uh, 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 deploy new collateral types, and we very much intend to do that. So that, that's going to be, uh, from a business standpoint, uh, we expect to launch a new batch of collateral types pretty pretty close following the launch of Notional V2. So we will definitely like uh, continue to add support for new collateral types that sort of fit fit within the risk framework of the protocol. So yeah, so I mean, you know, this stuff will, you know, we we, uh, we do a lot of this kind of risk work in-house um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's something that I think we, we put a significant emphasis on as a company and we want to put uh, an emphasis on as a community, um, sort of risk management of the protocol. And so I think that these collateralization ratios and new collateral types, you know, these things are going to be fluid and we definitely definitely intend to make Notional as capital efficient as can be without sacrificing the integrity of the protocol. Uh, and we want to uh, enable people to borrow against as wide a variety of collateral types as, as we can safely onboard. Okay. Um, maybe let's talk about the governance and how to add collateral types in a bit in the frame, uh, basically in, in the context of the token also. Um, but uh, just, just, Uh, for wrapping this up, so what happens if my loan is underwater? Uh, yeah, so so if your if your loan is underwater, basically, um, if you have become under collateralized, you are eligible for liquidation. So what a, liqui a liquidator can do is uh, they can purchase uh, a portion of your collateral and uh, you know deposit the uh, currency that you owe. Right. So if you are taking out a USDC loan collateralized by Ether, your liquidator can purchase some of your Ether and give you USDC in, you know, in exchange for that Ether. Um, so basically, you know, by doing that, they're going to reduce the risk of your account and, and re-collateralize re -collateralize your account. And what's the penalty? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the initial penalty we're going with um, for, so basically the liquidation penalty is going to vary by currency. Uh, now the liquidation penalty for Ether, um, the sort of the initial penalty we're uh, going for is 8%. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that is the liquidation penalty. Um, one thing, I know that we're talking about collateral here. And so one thing I wanted to mention, I think Teddy can describe this uh, better than I can, but one thing about Notional, which is different from Compound and Aave, is that um, in Notional, your collateral can also be liquidity provided into uh, Notional F cash markets, right? So uh, like Teddy mentioned, uh, ETH is both uh, tradable, uh, on in these F cash markets. So, you know, you could deposit ETH that'll be wrapped into C ETH uh, as your collateral, but you can also uh, deposit ETH and have it turned into liquidity, which is being provided on those ETH markets. So you'll be uh, earning additional sort of yield on your ETH uh, while it's being provided as collateral. So um, one thing about Notional, which, um, you know, I, I know we're talking about a very high level here, but there's a lot of depth in terms of the collateralization framework which allows people to uh, sort of collateralize uh, not only liquidity, but also uh, lending, right? So you can be lending ETH out at six months and be borrowing against it. Uh, so there's just a lot of ways to, uh, there's actually like beyond just the currency types, there's also like different sub, sort of subcategories of each currency uh, of how it can uh, be represented as collateral.
I don't know. T- Teddy can probably uh, explain this. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll just kind of like follow on that a little bit. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jeff, for sort of bringing that up. But like, but yeah. So, so if you want to take out a USDC loan uh, and you've got Ether as collateral, you can just deposit the Ether into Notional and borrow against it. Um, or, uh, like Jeff said, you can earn yield on your collateral while you're using it to borrow against. Right. So, so. If I've got my Ether, I can actually lend it at a fixed rate on Notional and then use that loan um, to borrow against, right? Uh, so I can, I can lend it. I can also provide liquidity on Notional. So uh, we haven't talked about this yet, um, but in Notional v2, we have this thing called N tokens, which is sort of our version of Notional liquidity tokens. So you can mint uh, N tokens from your Ether, so you can provide liquidity to Notional. Uh, and then borrow against that liquidity you've provided. So you can earn liquidity fees, you can earn note incentives, and then borrow against it, right? So uh, we think that this is like, uh, you know, it, it took a lot of work and uh, it adds like a lot of code to, to make sure that this works. Um, but we think that this is like a pretty killer feature because essentially what it means is that you are giving up nothing as a user, right? So there is no dead weight from your capital. Right. So like your collateral can always be earning an attractive rate of interest. So you never have to like just put up capital and not earn anything on it. And we think that that is pretty critical. And it's like it's something where it's like, you know, if you look at the the centralized uh, like OTC lending businesses and crypto, uh, they don't give you any. So when you borrow USDC and you, you know, collateralize that with Ether or wrapped Bitcoin, they just take your Ether. They don't give you any interest on it, right? And whereas like, so, so on Notional, this is an objectively better thing because you are earning all the, all the possible sort of interest and returns that comes from your collateral at the same time as you're using it to collateralize your loan. So we think that's pretty cool. That is cool. And uh, capital efficiency is something that is notoriously important to DeFi users. But um, this kind of brings me to a question for Jeff. Um, so Jeff, Jeff, in terms of security, I mean, so basically, this is this is often a criticism that's levied against DeFi, right? Basically, that it's a house of cards. And as soon as uh, one card falls, the entire house collapses. And I mean, we've seen that even tried and tested protocols such as Compound, I mean, Compound had a huge bug last week. And uh, I mean, it, 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 it wasn't catastrophic, and it paid out too much in fees and so on. So basically, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a catastrophic failure, but it was pretty severe bug. Um, so how, how do you go about mitigating this risk um, for your protocol and your users? Yeah, so, um, so I, I would say just like broadly, the way kind of the way we think about Notional, the product and, and like everything we do, you know, uh, our priorities, like number one is security. Um, number two is capital efficiency. And number three is like user experience. And we kind of evaluate everything we do sort of in that framework. And so in, I think security, uh, especially in DeFi, like it's sort of, it's just software quality, right? At, at the end of the day. Uh, and, and software quality, that's sort of like the highest level that you can like achieve. And that comes like kind of critical components of like good software quality, I think are well known. You know, it's, it's good documentation. It's naming your variables cleanly. You know, it's, uh, it's like being a really good like conscientious programmer like first and foremost, and then it's testing, right? It's just like exhaustive testing in like different scenarios. Um, and then even beyond that, you know, and like a lot of kind of issues, uh, you know, that are ongoing, but at the same time, it's one place where users and uh, like uh, developers uh, all value security like very highly, right? And you, you kind of don't see that in, uh, sort of like the more traditional software space, like security tends to be something on the back burner. Um, and so I think it's nice that users actually value this and and pay attention to like, you know, the audits and, you know, and care about those things. So, you know, you know, along those lines, you know, it's also not just testing, but it's audits and it's also like adopting new technology, right? So we're working with Sertora on formal verification and like kind of some of the newer kind of like fuzzing tools coming out, which uh, sort of, expand the capability of testing beyond just like 
um, just what we're kind of writing, uh, you know, right off the bat. So I think we're always looking for ways to just get more confidence around the code and uh, and just kind of ensure that that it is doing what, what we intended to do. Yeah. OK, so basically, if I step back one step, if you look at each individual module at each DeFi Lego brick, um, even if each individual Lego brick is structurally sound and well engineered and has clear APIs and uh, inputs and outputs and no intrinsic bugs, I mean, if you combine enough Lego bricks together, you can still get a structurally unsound system, right? So basically, and to me, that's also a systemic risk um, that kind of we as an ecosystem kind of need to think about how to go about this and how to protect the users who even despite the fact that maybe each individual brick is fine but if you if you actually stack them in a certain way it ends up being very much not fine um, so do you have any measures in place or any thoughts on how how we as an ecosystem should address that yeah, I yeah, I think that's I think that's a great question. Um, I would say what happened with Compound, you know, was it, I think for me was an eye opener, right? Because we, you know, we were integrating with Compound. It's it's a it's a dependency here, um, and you know, unlike some software dependencies where you can sort of hard fix a version, right? Like Compound's going to change. It's a dynamic sort of dependency, and so I I think it's something that. You know, we, at least for me, the, my takeaway was that, you know, I need to be, we, you know, I need to be paying more attention to what's happening there and sort of what they're doing um, on, on their side in governance, right? And I think, uh, that, I think that's true of a lot of protocols, um, which depend on Compound. And, you know, I, you know and, and I think that's, you know, I think at the end of the day, right, as we sort of become more interconnected, you know, I think it's sort of it's in our best interest to make sure that Compound is working well and, and working healthy. Um, you know, we depend on Uniswap for people to be able to kind of uh, trade out of positions um, during liquidation. So that's, you know, another thing that, you know, we we are going to do. We're going to monitor the liquidity pools on Uniswap and Curve and uh, make sure that they're deep enough for our liquidations. Um, and yeah, I think we, we just kind of need to be vigilant as sort of as, as a uh, community and a system, right? Because uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, we're, we're all dependent on each other. I'd like to ask you about the, the F token and uh, or F cash token. Uh, I, I read that there's a you guys have built a token standard or you're leveraging an existing token standard called the uh, ERC 1155. I, I have I, I never heard of this token standard. What does it do exactly? And how is it different from uh, uh, other tokens we may be familiar with? So I think most people are familiar with the ERC 20 token standard, um, which uh, so something about the ERC 20 token standard, which is nice and makes it easy to develop against and understand is that um, something like USDC is always going to be USDC. It's never really going to change. Um, we can pass it around to all of us and it'll sort of, it, it's going to remain USDC. Um, one unique characteristic of Fcash is that it matures. So on a particular day, uh, December 1st, you know, 2020, 2021, um, it's going to convert from a promise to like actual, like redeemable USDC, right? And so um, it sort of doesn't adhere to the expectations that you would have of an ERC-20 token because it, it changes at a very like uh, distinct point in the future. In addition, like one thing that we want to do with Notional and, and one like important piece of Notional is the ability to trade and create Fcash at different maturities, right? So we have the three and the six month and the one year. And one thing we haven't talked about and is available in Notional is the ability to actually uh, lend and borrow at dates that are in between those different points in time, right? So you can actually lend in OTC markets at nine months or eight months uh, if if that's something if that's a product that people want, right? And and a really cool part about Notional is that we can actually value that and value those F cash assets and let you borrow against them. But you know, sort of the scalability issue of creating ERC twenty tokens for each one of those dates and like you know having different token contracts from like a technical perspective, it uh, kind of becomes really cumbersome. And so that's why we chose the ERC-1155 standard, which we think uh, fits, the, fits the nature of the token much better. 
So the key thing about an ERC-1155 token is that it's sort of, uh, it's identified by an ID. And so each identifier will be like the currency and the date that sort of identifies the Fcash asset. And basically you can call that contract saying, you know, I would like to transfer, you know, December 1st USDC Fcash, and it'll sort of be able to locate it properly and transfer it. And what that does is it gives the developer a single contract, single point of entry for transferring all different types of Fcash assets. And that's kind of, it makes programming and kind of like understanding the system like a lot better. And one analogy I think for this uh, that kind of helps make it uh, more clear is that, uh, you know, in traditional finance, you know, if you're going to trade something like an equity, you go to the stock market, right? But if you're going to trade something like a bond, something with a fixed term, uh, fixed interest, like you go to different markets, right? You go to OTC desks or you go to like, you just go to different markets and they're not like, they're not sort of intermixable in the same standards, right? And I think that's something um, very similar here, right? This is a different type of asset. And so I think it requires a slightly different standard to to make a, make a good experience for the developer. Yeah. So, so it's it's it creates a token which has properties that where where you have common properties, but there's like a non fungibility between different characteristics of the same token. So it's like a one contract to manage different uh, uh, fungible tokens that are not fungible amongst each other. Is that like a good way? Of yeah, describing? yeah, that's that's great. So great way to describe. It. So USDC on December first is fungible with all other USDC on December first. But USDC on you know January first is not fungible with USDC on December first, right? So, so that way you know you kind of have these kind of stack maturities that are going out. They're fungible within themselves, but not between. Talking about maturity, uh, who who defines these maturity uh, periods? And I, I I suspect it's governance. Uh, so maybe we could uh, talk about that a little bit and uh, how all these uh, maturity dates get um, get defined. Yep. So uh, again, this is in Notional v2. In Notional v2, um, so one thing about Notional is that when when you provide liquidity, uh, it it gets distributed across the different Fcash markets, and so that that has the effect of uh, fragmenting liquidity across these different pools. So one thing that we didn't want to have happen is uh, get have it get fragmented across too many pools. So what we've done with Notional v2 is we sort of um, hard coded uh, like a F cash market cadence that will go from three month to six month to one year to two year to five year to ten year uh, and then to uh, twenty year. So that's sort of like the defined cadence of the F cash markets going out into the future. And governance will sort of enable uh, like turn them on as as we go forward. So we're going to start with the first three. Uh, three months, six months, and one year. Um, so that's what users will be able to lend and borrow on the liquidity pools. Um, but like as I mentioned, with the actual like uh, token standard underneath there, um, there is the ability for uh, like OTC trading, like direct trading between two parties at uh, sort of dates in between uh, kind of those liquidity pools. Um, I don't know, Teddy, if you want to add anything to that. Um, no, I think that's that's uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. So so there's like we have this sort of predefined maturity cadence, um, which references a uh, a, a reference time uh, that rolls forward every three months. Um, so basically, you know, you might have uh, January first. Let's see, what would it be? It would be I suppose it would be December first, March first, uh, and. December 1st, 2022, those might be your liquidity pools. Uh, and then once you uh, get to December 1st, those dates would roll forward. They would all roll forward. So then you'd have March 1st, June 1st, and June 1st, 2022. So every three months, the active maturities for the liquidity pools are going to roll forward three months. When do you plan to introduce um, the longer cadence ones? Because, I mean, these w would be also super interesting um, to see how people gauge the future of the ecosystem, right? So basically, if, you, if you're if you going to buy a 20-year fixed loan on a DeFi product, uh, this this has so many externalities that go into this besides what you think money is going to cost for the next 20 years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, I think it'll be a little while before we get to 20 years, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, basically our, our intention here is, is, you know, there's there's a lot of things to consider when we uh, activate one of these sort of longer data maturities. So, so as Jeff said, we're launching with a three month, a six month and a one year. So the next thing to turn on would be the two year. Right. And and when you turn that on, it's very, very difficult to. And, and I think technically it might be impossible to turn it off. Um, but uh, but, you know, basically it's, it's hard to go back on it. Right. And so once you once you turn it on, uh, you need to sort of support it in perpetuity pretty much. Um, now, because of that, uh, you know, it's not a decision that we take lightly uh, and kind of the downside or one of the downsides of turning turning on one of these longer data maturities is that you distribute the total liquidity amongst a greater number of liquidity pools. So you're sort of fracturing liquidity. So there's like a very tangible downside to opening up one of these act, one of these longer data maturities. Um, but so basically, we want to be sure that uh, you know people really want it um, prior to prior to turning it on. And then and the way we like are gonna sort of figure that out uh, is by, you know, so in Notional V1, we had a three month and a six month maturity. And we saw that, you know, the, the vast majority of the activity was in the six month, right? So this sort of made us believe that, you know, what people really want with fixed rates, they want long durations. Um, and so that's why we're launching the one year at launch with Notional V2. Uh, and so we're going to go see and, and see what happens, you know, like, is the majority of the activity going to be in the one year? And, and are, you, are users going to tell us that they want uh, long, even longer data maturities? Um, so, you know, I think that a lot of it is just sort of like, you know, um, we're, we're extending the maturity horizon with Notion V2. We're going to see what people think, see, you know, like listen to what they tell us. And if they do want a two year and we're satisfied that, that there's going to be a decent enough amount of activity to justify putting liquidity in that two year, uh, then, uh, you know, we should be able to turn it on. That makes complete sense, but it kind of leads me to my next question. Who is we? So who decides what's the governance look like? Good question. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so we have, uh, uh, in Notion V2, as, as I alluded to earlier in this, in this podcast, uh, we are issuing a, you know, the, the protocol's governance token, the note. Um, and, uh, you know, like our, the governance decision making, so protocol upgrades and, and risk parameter changes, um, that's all going to be subject to on-chain voting by note holders, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, we, we've pretty much, um, We've pretty much forked compound governance, uh, and and maybe Jeff can say a little bit about exactly um, any any kind of differences between the way our governance module works and the compound governance module works. But before we get there, I'll just say a little bit about uh, you know the sort of the token distribution. So you know note holders are going to be making these decisions, um, uh, and and we are really uh, you know we really believe that uh, ultimately. You know, we want Notional to be foundational infrastructure for this new financial system. And so we want to dis, uh, distribute and uh, the governance of the protocol and to sort of decentralize control. Um, and so to that end, uh, we have earmarked about 55 to 60% of the total token supply uh, for the community to be distributed uh, mainly through liquidity incentives. Um, but also through a, a foundation that will support the community with ecosystem grants um, and sort of, you know, development grants. Um, but basically, you know, over the next few years, we plan to distribute uh, that, you know, majority of the tokens to people that aren't us, basically. Um, and so, you know, we, we plan to progressively decentralize um, the effective control of the protocol. Um, Yeah, and then and Jeff, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about uh, you know our governance system from a technical standpoint. I mean, the governance system will work very similar to Compound, you know, in terms of voting and and the way it, it can make changes to the protocol. Um, I think you know this is an area I would say is um, you know there's potential for us to up you know as a 
protocol as, as a kind of community to decide to upgrade and change that um, to, I guess there's, you know, tons of different governance models out there. So, you know, I would just say like, you know, where we're starting is kind of like a starting point and we'll kind of see um, what what the protocol needs um, to, to do from a governance standpoint to kind of change that. Um, one thing that the way we're parameterizing it, I think this is kind of like um, maybe interesting is like, so Compound currently has like a seven day uh, cadence. I think everyone's kind of aware of this now of, of actually getting changes through. So one thing, you know, we're keenly aware of is that this is a new protocol, um, you know, as we go out. And, and so we want to be able to make some changes quicker. So we're going to uh, shorten that time cadence for us to be to about two and a half days in the beginning. And as the protocol matures, as we feel more comfortable about that, we'll kind of elongate that uh, time cadence. Uh, so, you know, just uh, as a way to to kind of represent uh, the maturity of the system. Yeah, so, uh, but otherwise I think it, it works pretty similar to Compound. One thing that I, I thought would be really cool here is if, um, you know, cause like lo lots of people, I'd say, uh, have positions in Aave and they may want to move those positions into something like Notional to benefit like basically from a better interest rate or like at least a fixed interest rate. Is is there a way or are there like products that you know of or like, you know, without having to code your own flash loan contract where basically you could say, okay, here's my position on Aave. I want to move it over to Compound. This is how much gas it's going to cost, but it's going to happen and I'm going to be able to move all of those positions there uh, in kind of one transaction. Because that's something that I, I think like I would use. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, so I, I think Instadap does this between Compound and Aave, although I'm not like entirely certain. But we uh, actually, as part of like the code that we've uh, open sourced for Notional V2, there's a there's a flash loan contract that will move your Compound um, you know variable borrow into Notional, um, and then essentially like uh, flip you from a uh, like a variable rate into a fixed rate borrow um, in a single transaction. Um, and then also um, on the flip side, actually, if you're holding C tokens and you actually just want to lend at a fixed rate, um, you can actually just deposit those into Notional and receive F cash in return. And so that you can actually flip your uh, variable rate loan into a fixed rate loan um, directly. Um, with the Aave integration, since we're not uh, using Aave as the underlying money market in Notional V2, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of swapping from Aave is, is something is that is possible. And um, we'll, we'll definitely look into, uh, it's something that, you know, as Teddy alluded to, as part of like building the community, um, those are the types of things that I think the foundation would look to um, uh, supporting through like development grants and, and things of that nature. So maybe um, let's zoom out to the ecosystem a bit. Um, in your view, um, what are the next um, milestones um, that will hit in the DeFi um, system. So I mean, we 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 this this week we we saw that uh, Sebastian helped me out here. Uh, French bank Société Générale Forge. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, made a maker proposal. So I mean, what 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 do you? I mean, so basically, Teddy, as as someone um, coming from uh, traditional finance, uh, what do you think um, the next year is gonna look like? Okay, yeah, so that, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I think, you know, first, first of all, let me just um, uh, say that, you know, obviously I'm biased, but I do think that, that Notional V2 is going to unlock, like, uh, some really cool stuff in DeFi that you haven't been able to do. So I'm just going to say that real quick first, uh, because basically, uh, so these Fcash tokens that we've been talking about, um, they, you know, allow you to define and manipulate cash flows at specific future dates, where you have guaranteed liquidity via the notional infrastructure. Um, and that's something that you do not, that you've never had before in DeFi. And so you're going to be able to like create, you know, really cool sort of fixed income security, well, sorry, fixed income products. Like for example, uh, coupon bonds, right? So, so you could like, you could essentially bundle uh, a number of these Fcash tokens together such that you could buy uh, a bond that would give you fixed payments on a periodic cadence. So you could have, like, you could, you know, uh, lend $100 for two years and you'd get fixed payments every quarter, right? Um, as opposed to, like, taking the entire payment at the end, right? And I think that that's, that's something that's really cool. It's obviously a super popular product in traditional finance. You can't do it in DeFi today. 
Um, and, and something like Fcache allows you to do that. Um, so that's just, okay, so that's just my little thing on notion I had to say. Um, now I think like from uh, a more sort of macro perspective, yeah, I think this is going to be a really, really interesting year to come for DeFi. Because I, you know, I, I still talk to a lot of my sort of friends in traditional finance. And it, like even some of the more conservative ones, like they're coming around to DeFi. They really are. And uh, I think like it's past the point now where you know, we've, we've hit the big numbers. And so we've gotten people to pay attention. And we've sort of like, I think, proven out uh, like some real product market fit here. And the longer we stick around and like these things continue to work, um, like just the more undeniably useful, like uh, this space starts to look to outsiders, right? So I think that the number, absolute number one thing that people, uh, that has made sort of more mainstream users uh, uh, wary about DeFi is is the security risk, right? So the, the idea of like, because you just think about how weird it is, right? So it's like, I'm going to take my money and I'm just going to like put it in a computer program, right? And there's nobody I can call if like things don't work as, as, as they're supposed to, right? It's like a really weird thing. And it's like a psychological barrier that you, that you need to get over. And then really the only way to make people comfortable with doing that is, is time, right? And it's time that these things are operating and they're operating correctly and people are getting their money back when they're supposed to, right? Um, and, you know, we've had time now where these systems have been operating safely and securely, right? And uh, I think that, you know, over the next year that will just continue like, um, that will continue and, and people will become sort of more confident and less worried about sort of uh, smart contract risks. Um, and I think that, you know, we're also seeing uh, innovations in sort of like the, the DeFi insurance space that are going to get people more comfortable, which I think is like super interesting. And, and you know, basically the, the thing that's, that's the barrier to entry is, is risk, right? So it's smart contract risk, it's regulatory risk. And I think over the next year, uh, you're going to see like a significant diminishment in both of those risks, right? So like one, just with additional time and, and sort of new insurance solutions coming to market for DeFi, that's going to reduce the smart contract risk. And then kind of the other thing is, um, you know, like a, a, a lessening in the regulatory risk. Because I think that, you know, like I saw like a, a headline uh, that the FDIC is looking to potentially insure stablecoin issuers, right? Or like offer insurance to stablecoin issuers or to like approved stablecoin issuers. And I think that like, you know, there is a, uh, a recognition that, that DeFi is important. And uh, I think regulators in the US are, you know, going to be offering some actual clarity within the next year in this space. And that's going to, uh, I think, make a lot of people, sort of more mainstream users, much more comfortable. Um, so I think that, you know, in the next year, you're going to see like a lot of the risks and barriers to entry significantly reduced. And that's not even talking about like, and I hadn't mentioned, but like the, you know, layer two solutions coming online. So I think like a year from now, you could see like a lot less more contract risk, a lot less regulatory risk and lower gas fees because of layer two. And I think if you put all those things, like those things together, then it's like DeFi is just like a no-brainer and it's objectively superior to uh, traditional finance. And, and so I think it's like a super exciting time. But I, I totally agree um, on many parts of what you just said. Um, the one issue where I feel like um, my personal feeling is um, more or less diametrically opposed to what you just said is regulatory, right? So basically, it basically to me, the feeling is that regulators, especially in the US, um, are um, not moving in a great direction. I, I, I think that, uh, I, well, I think it's up for debate, I would say. I mean, I think that, you know, people have obviously, like, some of the stuff from some certain officials has like caused concern in the crypto space. But I think that in the US, what you've actually seen is like significant pushback um, from people who are very, you know, like, like pro crypto and pro innovation in the US. I think that there's like a non negligible, uh, you know, number of politicians that are really on our side. 
And and that I find very encouraging. And I think that there's a growing recognition from sort of what, what we've seen. You know, yes, there are people who are against crypto, but I think that there is a growing recognition that this that this space is going to be, you know, extremely important. Uh, and like, just like this thing is growing extremely rapidly. This thing is going to be big. Right. And, and I think that there's a growing recognition of that. And uh, there are a lot of people who want to make sure that that the U.S. has like places a stake, places a flag there. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really actually pretty optimistic from that standpoint. Okay, that's good to hear. It's always it's always nice to hear people be optimistic about uh, the regulatory environment. Um, so, Teddy, Jeff, uh, when is Notion version 2 coming out? Uh, yeah, so we're targeting first week in November. Um, yeah, so that's that's what we're targeting. I, I think we'll I think we'll do it. Uh, so I'm I'm again I'm I'm optimistic. I I see Jeff chuckling in the background. So. Uh, We'll look out uh, first week of November. Um, and where can uh, people find out more about you? Where where can they um, go and uh, partake in governance and uh, in liquidity mining and so on? Uh, yep. So you can visit our website, notional.finance. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter to hear all of the updates on, on what we're doing. Uh, that's at Notional Finance. And uh, you can also just jump in our Discord and, and ask us questions. We're all there. Um, we're very responsive. Uh, Discord.notional.finance is the link there. Um, and yeah, and uh, you know, keep in touch and, and let us know if you have any questions or uh, you know any stuff that you that you want to see us build. Cool. Thank you guys. That was uh, super interesting. <laughs>